things that we're going to talk about here that have to do with global climate change and particularly the role of microorganisms in that uh, dynamic process that's taking place. But also I want to talk about the link to science education and public literacy. Uh, so this is the actual title. And one of the things I want to point out is, as many of us know, climate change has become a major issue in the public domain. And unfortunately, I think all too often, some of the scientific bases for what is happening gets lost as we talk about the social and the political aspects, which are real, and the economic ones. Uh, but I also want to emphasize the importance of living things in this climatic change process. Uh, we all know that humans have made a major change in the Earth, uh, either by uh, changing the actual physical geography and building great cities and so forth, and we now also know by our Industrial Revolution putting CO2 out into the air, but probably what's less uh, publicized is the role of microorganisms in this process. The microorganisms, you know, bacteria and other things I'm going to show you, uh, and I hope to uh, demonstrate these microorganisms are more abundant than you may think in the world, drive what we call the carbon cycle, that is the change of carbon through its various elemental compositions and molecular compositions. Uh, uh, they have a major role in that process, and since CO2 is part of the climate change debate, I want to try to elucidate a little bit what's going on with those. Uh, so uh, there's a whole network of interactions that take place that uh, uh, explain how our role as humans in the sources of CO2 in the atmosphere interact with uh, what these organisms are doing. And then I want to talk a bit how we use network ideas in teaching in uh, science education and public literacy uh, to build on the scientific networks I'm going to show you that uh, indicate people who think in network ways are able to think more effectively and learn science more, more proficiently. And so these are the topics I'll be talking about. First, the scientific causes of global warming in a nutshell. The role of the terrestrial microbes in that uh, process. Uh, the role in the, on land and sea and the coupling of the atmospheric processes that are going on, then start talking about uh, an integrated network model of that process and then evidence of how that kind of thinking can enhance our understanding of science and these problems and issues. First of all, a quick recap on what's happening with the effects of carbon dioxide on global warming. As you know, the sun produces sunlight and that radiates the earth, but that visible light also becomes heat energy in the earth. And some of that heat energy then uh, begins to radiate back out from the uh, surface of the earth into the universe beyond us. Uh, but clouds, when they're present, low clouds can partly trap that heat. We all know on a cloudy night, we have a warmer night than one that's cloud free. Uh, but also, CO2 from its many sources serve as a molecular type of cloud, if you will that uh, partly absorbs that heat coming back that the sun has indirectly produced and then traps it. And that's the, fu the fundamental physical basis of what's happening in our environment. We have to recognize this. This is a fact. Uh, this part is a fact. We can't deny that we produce a huge amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and other things as well I'm going to explain in a moment. And that increase has uh, gone up from about 300 back at the beginning of the century to 400 parts per million. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, it's 0.04 percent, but this stuff is so effective in trapping the heat. But even that apparently small increase has made a major change in the heat uh, capacity of the atmosphere. Now, what happens to that heat? Well, if it can't radiate out, some of it is actually taken up by the ocean. And we'll be using this schemata throughout to kind of organize our explanations and thinking. Uh, some of it is literally absorbed by the ocean, and presently that's what's happening. We have best evidence there's been a plateau in this gradual rise of the temperature on the Earth, partly because the huge quantity of the ocean, like a big bathtub, is taken up. But that's going to come out again. It can't be there in that reservoir forever. So it's not a solution to the issue of where we're going to go in the future to not have increasing elevation of global temperature. But I need to point out that Lo and behold, <laughs> these small organisms, the bacteria and the protists, these uh, things you used to call protozoa, particularly in the soil, breathe out, as we do, if I use that uh, carbon dioxide as part of their life processes. 
and I will show you it's a, a substantial amount. So what we want to do is understand how all of these processes are interrelated, our part in producing CO2 and the other organisms in the Earth, and what are some of the mitigating processes that they uh, contribute to this uh, process. First of all, a little bit about carbon, very briefly. It's remarkable enough that as far as the Earth's crust is concerned, only 0.03% of carbon is in the crust, but in the human body it's 18%. And as you can see, compared to other things, life has really purchased on car. It's a major part of the building blocks of the tissue and the molecules in our living system. So inherently, because life has evolved to take in carbon, use carbon, it becomes then a major link between life and the surrounding environment. Uh, moreover, if we ask, well, who's more important? Humans are microbes, and I hope you will excuse me if I seem to diminish <laughs> the importance of humanity, but in this many respect, <laughs> the carbon biomass on the Earth is about 100 million tons for humans, uh, which, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, much less than 300 billion tons of carbon uh, that come from microbes. Uh, so, Believe it or not, these tiny things which normally you see in your cheese or in your yogurt, <laughs> those aren't the main ones that contribute to this. All the microbes in the globe around the Earth have a huge quantity of carbon through their tremendous number. That's all. There are typically 4 million bacterial cells in a gram of soil about the size of a pea. And all total, there are as much as 5 million trillion trillion bacteria on the Earth. That's 10 to 30 zeros after. So if you probably Imagine this, I'm just giving you some numbers to really help you understand. And in fact, if you were to take all the solid surface of the Earth away, you'd still see all the topography. Because there would be so many in the, in the soil, on the rock, everywhere else, that you would still see the major physical geography of the Earth. If you took the solid away just through the little factory and other things in the unit. Uh, now, let's begin to ask the question, what is the role of these little microbes then in the carbon cycle? Uh, in relation to other living things such as plants. Well, fundamentally, the animal and microorganisms, of course, produce CO2 by uh, respiration, and we all know plants do photosynthesis and take it up. So there's a dynamic balance here that particularly animal-like heterotrophic organisms, including microbes, breathe out CO2, they eat the products of the plants, or take up the products of the plants. In this case, soil microbes take products from the plant roots. And that's something we need to consider later as I talk about this. Uh, but then the plants take up some CO2. And the marine biota I'm going to talk about in a moment are very important in, in taking up substantial amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now, uh, among these things that are take, uh, producing the CO2 are bacteria, of course, which we are familiar with, but also the proteins, the protozoa, which Many of us think, oh, I've seen that, I've seen these immediately in high school or college, right? They're just something you put on the stock, you know, it's kind of like, uh -uh, folks, I gotta tell you, <laughs> these organisms like the bacteria are huge in number. I gave you the number of bacteria, but these are close to an order of magnitude same in number, and uh, they're putting out CO2 too, also. So these are all contributing to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and I need to talk about how much. Uh, if we look at how uh, life in the soil is organized, bacteria are the source of food for all these microorganisms, very much like plants are for much of our life and the animals on the surface of the earth. The bacteria grow in very large numbers. Uh, they put out CO2. Uh, they're about 10 to the 8 uh, per gram of soil. It's 10 to the 8 zeros after a huge number. Then the nanoflagellates are these smaller microorganisms that feed on the bacteria. There are less of them as you go up the food chain. Then the amoebae, uh, which feed on both of those. And finally, the testate amoebae, which have these shells around them, are less. But they're also abundant. All of these are putting out CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, so all of these organisms proliferate as they have more available carbon sources. Uh, and uh, bacteria, due to their abundance, account for the greatest amount. Uh, however, the total amount for all these can be substantial. For example, here's something you may not realize. I've already probably diminished our footprint by saying how many more than there are. But they actually put out 10 times more CO2 in the atmosphere than all of our power plants and everything else. Uh, in other words, 
they are tremendously productive of CO2, and uh, we put out approximately 40 billion tons of CO2 each year worldwide. So we're talking about 400 billion tons of CO2 coming out of the soil from these little organisms. <laughs> and as I'll point out in a minute, the warmer it gets, the more active they get, and the more they put out. And if they have more organic substances coming from other sources like plants, the more they're going to put out. So there's part of the problem. We've got to talk about these three forward loops as they're known. Uh, so if we look at this, what's been the history? Well, in the history, the planet has developed and evolved. So without our tremendous input, everything was in balance pretty much for over nearly hundreds of thousands of years. The microbial CO2 that's come out, the plants in the flourishing growing to keep it all in balance. So for all those hundreds of thousands of years, literally hundreds of thousands of years, the carbon dioxide concentration on our planet has been constant, near to 300 parts per million. Million, parts per million, sorry, parts per million. It has been very steady. It was only until the 1800s when we started burning fossil fuels that this tremendous increase exponentially has been taking place. So, <coughs> fundamentally, I this is not a cycle, right? <laughs> uh, Fundamentally, what has happened is we shifted the balance from CO2 going uh, into plants enough and putting out more than the planet has normally experienced. And uh, if we look at this then, uh, in terms of this balance, uh, as the Earth is warming, the effects uh, on terrestrial organisms are most evident in places such as the Arctic, <coughs> at the poles. The reason being, of course, for all those hundreds of thousands of years, the polar Arctic has been constantly going through a normal cycle of very long, deep winters. Some brief summertime, and actually they grow food up there in the summer, people don't realize this, and not snow up there all the time, but typically there have been very long winters, and most of the organisms I'll show you on the soil up there are small plants and mosses. They have been developing huge layers of organic matter in what they call the permafrost, and it's been frozen there for many, many millennia, thousands of years, and as such, when it's frozen, the microorganisms can't get to it. But as it warms, and has been warming up there, incidentally, does anyone know what the maximum temperature was uh, in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska last year? Stop me. It's like 40, something in the 40s or something? Centigrade, well, actually 98 degrees Fahrenheit. A whole week of 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And even though it's been one of the worst winters here down in Minnesota, they were at least 20 degrees warmer in Alaska. All that cold air is coming down here due to climate change, but the Arctic is unfreezing. And as it unfreezes, the problem is these microorganisms are going to put out more and more CO2. This is some research I've done on the problems up in the Arctic, and here I've modeled just how much CO2 will come out as we warm uh, the planet. Uh, you have to determine the thaw depth of that uh, very sparse kind of mossy environment. If you know the thaw depth, you can predict how active the bacteria and the protozoa will be. And in terms of uh, pounds of CO2 per square uh, five miles, that's about one quarter of the size of Manhattan. You can see uh, eventually we can put out as much as nearly uh, over 18,000 pounds of uh, CO2 per five square miles. I'm using terms I don't know the miles rather than the scientific units. From these organisms alone, and there are hundreds of thousands of square miles. It's unknown with these organisms putting out the CO2. So the challenge to us is this problem called a positive feedback loop. As we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, we warm the Earth more, the Arctic thaws, and there it's thawing so fast, incidentally, that the fishery communities on the north slopes on the Arctic Ocean are falling into the sea because it's unthawing so much. They have to move them a mile back. Literally, they move the houses about a mile every year to prevent them from falling into the ocean because it's thawing. Now, again, I'm not trying to paint the scenario of doom and doom. I'm just pointing out that there are such rapid changes in places that we have to be concerned that we are making a change in the Earth in spite of some people's denial of it. Uh, 
and there are economic and other reasons why we have to be concerned about how we approach this problem, but clearly the Arctic is changing, it is unthawing, and as it does, more and more CO2 is going to come out, more than we're producing. So that's part of the issue. Is that kind of understandable what's happening? What is it called? Oh, positive feedback. We're encouraging, in other words, these little organisms that really go at it uh, indirectly. <laughs> now, uh, at the lowest projected thaw depth, and 50% active bacteria, uh, the rate is going to be about 5 million pounds per hour of CO2. Well, let's look at this and uh, ask where possibly will all this CO2 go that's being produced by us and them? Uh, well, part of it, as I mentioned, can go into the ocean. Not only uh, be, being taken up as dissolved CO2 in the ocean, which it does, but also, more importantly, other microorganisms are going to be our helpers in this. They are, partially, are and can be our salvation to a degree. There's a limit. There are the plankton in the ocean, the microplankton, which are also small organisms, a little larger typically than those in that soil, many of them, some same size. But the ones most important are those that fix the CO2, take up the CO2 and put it in their shells, partly, are taken up, as I'll show you, in algae, other small green plants that live with them, and by their activity alone right now, 1 to 1.2 billion tons of that carbon dioxide goes down into the sediments each year. When, when they take it up, then they descend through sedimentation into the depths of the ocean. They take that with them as calcium carbonate, for example, mainly, and down there, of course, and it's buried, good, it's out of the way for most of the time because it will turn into rock eventually, calcium carbonate rock. So that is a sink, an important sink. While these fellows here are putting out more and more, these have a capacity to take it up but to a limit. And there's another problem I'll speak about in a moment. But where are these things? They're beautiful. These are some that I've worked with over many decades now. This is a planktonic foraminifera, means a floating chambered microorganism. You can see it's about a hundredth of an inch. This is its shell, calcite, glassy like shell, but it's calcium carbonate. And it has spines, and all of the spines are little green algae, well, yellow green algae. And these take up CO2 like any plant. You have millions of these uh, per a cubic uh, mile in the ocean, let's say. Uh, you have quite a bit taken up by these things, just like plants take up. And if we look uh, at this process, some of it also goes then into the shell, making these shells. And they're particularly what, <coughs> when they die, go down into the sediments. And incidentally, in paleoecology, we study these organisms because each shell is unique to a species. And some species uh, live in warmer parts of the ocean, and others cooler. And by looking in the sediments, you can tell how warm the Earth has been by the ones that are most abundant. And in the past, it's been cooler, and it's also been warmer. And incidentally, I might say, uh, well over uh, a couple hundred million years ago, the whole Earth was as about warm as we have it now. Anyone have any idea why there'd be so much CO2 in the atmosphere way back then when we weren't putting it out? What was another source of CO2 that could come out of the Earth? The animals? Well, well, partly animals were around, uh, but small ones. Uh, but volcanic activity. Volcanic activity. Way back then, the Earth was much more volcanic in its activity than it is now, fortunately. <laughs> and uh, that, in addition to putting out smoke, outputs a lot of CO2 out. And those natural processes produce the warming of the Earth, which is clear evidence, folks, geologically. And what we're doing is just like those volcanoes. The result inevitably will be warming of the Earth, unless we do something to try to ameliorate uh, uh, that. But anyway, back to the microorganisms. Uh, so these will take up quite a bit. If we do a look at these a little algal synthesis <coughs> electron microscope, this is a section like you may have seen in your high school biology sections, but with electron microscope, you will see that they have a big vac vacuole, but they also have numerous chloroplasts all around the periphery. This is where they take up the light, this is where they <coughs> fix the CO2, absorb it to help get into the organism and eventually down into the sediment. So this unique uh, case of these uh, little organisms having this little form, they take with them, form of green algae as a way that they uh, maintain their life and also help us get CO2 out. Uh, what's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, this is uh, an example of how much uh, carbon can take up by the effect of those little algae. 
Now, what's other, one other thing, this is a beautiful organism, this is one of the Radularia that John Alagranti mentioned that I work with. Uh, these are somewhat larger, but they have a, like, a bubble capsule around them, uh, keeping them afloat here are their algae. They take up the CO2. Here's another one with very radiating cytoplasmic strands with their algae. But the shell is made of silica, glassy-like silica. I'm going to show you in a moment an organism, keep in mind, that evolved millions of years ago. Look at this. This is, a, uh, again, this any human construction, all made of glassy silicate, the cells inside this little dome, and it sends out the cytoplasmic flowing, molding portions, and it creates this remarkable uh, lattice and I-beam structure. Here's a detail on this. Here's the I-beam type structure. Here's all the lattice. Look, look at the detail of this structure here. And repaired. Part of its lattice that got broken, you can see it was melted here and here. This thing is small as a capital A on your printed page, and yet it produces this remarkable uh, assembly. <laughs> and all this is in the, from the DNA in one cell. It's testimony how evolution has developed the capacity to use a single cell to create a remarkably complex, geometrically solid and stable structure that any human, I think, would <laughs> appreciate. Yeah. And we've done some engineering modeling of this and found that this structure, particularly the base, is as strong as any human bridge structure of a similar construction. And that's millions of years ago before that came along. <laughs> so life is remarkable, and our own remarkable quality is due to the fact early on how much a single cell is capable of doing. Well, back to the story. They also have algal symbionts, so it's just a more in the electron microscope. They take up the seal. So fundamentally, then, we have this one <coughs> immediate source of a amelioration of our own putting so much CO2 out. It's these many, many millions and millions of microorganisms per cubic bushel, if you want to think of it that way, that are taking this stuff out of the atmosphere. But there's a limit to that. And the other problem is this. As the CO2 goes into the ocean, it is absorbed, but then turns into carbonic acid. When CO2 mixes with water, it's carbonic acid. And all the protons, the acid protons, like in your vinegar, start coming out. When, and the oceans are decreasing in pH. That's getting more acid year by year because of the CO2 going in there. So what is immediately seeming to be a salvation for us has a side product, which is serious. And that is it's dropping from the typical alkaline, that is, 7.8 pH is sort of like uh, your uh, arm and hammer or sodium bicarbonate, you know, down into increasingly more acidic uh, levels. And as a result of that, two things happen. Uh, that partly then starts releasing CO2 back into the atmosphere, largely because these shelled organisms that have the calcium carbonate start dissolving. So instead of going down now, uh, they're being dissolved by the more acidic ocean. Uh, conditions and the CO2 is coming back up. So the one salvation we have with going down is being mitigated by the fact we're acidifying the oceans and they can't make their shell moreover. So this whole sink process is becoming increasingly at risk, further contributing to other problems. Now, uh, what I must point out here is that uh, as the uh, CO2 goes up. Also, plants may tend to increase. Oh, sorry, and uh, I see this slide it doesn't have any here. But plants may increase, and as a result, there's another slight uh, change that you know, you know about. And that is the plants in the Arctic, particularly, as small shrubby plants expand, put out a lot of organic secretions into the soil, and then these microorganisms, as I said, will take it up. There's one positive thing I can tell you from my research. I'm happy to share. Everyone has been worrying about, well, when this happens, you know, they put out a lot of stuff from the ruts, how much of that's going to come back out in the atmosphere due to this increased effect of our warming on the plants. I found out in the laboratory simulation by doing research with the microorganisms that, in fact, the pulse of organic matter that comes out is only minimally productive of CO2. Less than 1% of that carbon going in here comes out as CO2, the rest gets incorporated in the actual biomass and its structure. So there's a good news. <laughs> I don't want to be entirely sounding though I'm uh, uh, belaboring the point of our difficulties with this. Uh, 
that fundamentally this process of the plants increasing will likely be a positive thing. That is, they won't contribute so much organic matter that these will put it back out in the atmosphere. It gets pretty much incorporated in their structures and so forth in the terrestrial system. So fundamentally, now here's where we are. We have then in this quick overview, in this one particular aspect of the role of my garden, is what we call a network model. A network model is a system basically of multi-causal relationships where we try to explain how things affect one another. He said there's the moss in the Arctic which produces organic matter and that drives the microbes to produce CO2. Uh, but they take up some CO2, the moss too, in the summer when it gets up there to 98 degrees or whatever then they can actually take it up, hopefully more than they're going to put out, that's another issue we don't know. Plants take some of it up, the roots, however, put some out, and uh, in addition, though, some goes into the ocean and some comes back. So this is a network model which I presented in a pretty nominal way. It can be more complex with actual values on it, and it's a simple model, network model. But it explains, I think, some of the dynamics of what's going on. But the problem is more complex, I think, than many of us would like to understand. <laughs> so that you can't just talk about in broad terms what's happening or is not happening. There are many subtleties to it. Uh, so the question comes then, will there be a new balance that's established? And we are running models to try to understand that, but presently we don't know. So here we are on this network model. What I'd like to do now is transition a little bit into the research I've done in science learning and public understanding of this because we have focused uh, here on people's understanding of these network models and are generally how they network information and what effect it has on their science learning. So I'd like to net, uh, transition into that research, the science education research. Basically what we do is uh, we ask uh, people who have studied science to in interview or in written format to tell us what they've learned. And then we look for the way in which they interrelate information as a network. For example, uh, uh, here's a student learned about rocks, and you can see the connections the student has made in terms of the various relationships. These arrows simply indicate the connections. There are then logical connections. We would call that a fairly good network. The question is, does that kind of knowledge have any effect? on people's ability to learn science and to reason about it. And it varies considerably, incidentally, among college students as well as pre-college students in their ability to make those networks. But we know psychologically from cognitive theory that the stability of the information in memory and greater accessibility uh, should occur during recall if you have networks. Uh, also, we know that uh, you should be able to assimilate new knowledge uh, if you have those organized networks, and you can anchor the new knowledge to the structural networks that you have. And there should be greater efficiency and efficacy in applying that. If you have this organized knowledge, you should be able to mobilize it and use it better. So we've been studying to what extent these theoretical assumptions uh, can be uh, uh, examined in actual learning studies. And what we found with the first one is, is there a greater achievement for students who have uh, uh, greater network scores, and this was done with Dave Randall and uh, Mr. Proxis, uh, who is was up at the school near the American Museum of Natural History some years ago. And what we find, indeed, if you look at the increasing network scores of students, their knowledge that they've gained <coughs> goes up pretty dramatically. So it does give some evidence, and this has been replicated many times now, that the more networking students can do, the more knowledge they well, that's something that's pretty simple. And here's an example of the differential kind of knowledge that is uh, acquired. The network scores go up. Uh, if they're studying ecology, uh, you can see that uh, if they're studying uh, systems, you get an increase over time as their network scores improve. And ecological relationships, which are simpler to acquire, go up also, but more so. So systems thinking definitely improves uh, as students' knowledge networks in, are increased. So uh, that's another example. This is with Paul Bischoff. I'll acknowledge some of these people later and where they are currently. Uh, the next question is, uh, how can they use that information in problem solving and scientific inquiry? Does it help them when they have network scores that are high in their understanding of, of science uh, uh, processes and their inquiry thinking and learning? 
In this case, we looked at how well students could uh, do a laboratory experiment where they had to analyze uh, evolutionary trees, for example, like this one. This is an example of how we think modern flowering plants evolved, starting way back from simple plants. You get the ferns coming off, and then eventually simpler flowering plants and the more advanced flowering plants. And then the students were asked to study uh, plant tissue and actually do an online analysis of the evolutionary patterns using genetic molecular genetic evidence from online. That's what kids are doing now. And we wanted to find out whether the students who had more networking capacity were able to do this task of generating the phylogenetic data and the evolutionary data better than those who had less networking. And uh, what we found was that in terms of the knowledge of the of the phylogenetic tree, the students' network scores were fairly strongly uh, correlated with their ability to do that. Uh, significant point of one. Uh, and their inquiry skills, actually they're really thinking about what they were doing, explaining what they were doing, much more strongly related, uh, correlation of 0 0.6. So we have information now that networking does improve knowledge acquisition, but it also improves the ability to do something with your knowledge, to be able to analyze scientific data, to be able to think about scientific data. So that was the second thing. Any, any questions? Uh, kind of going quickly because I have a timer here. Yes. Uh, Could you please define a little bit more of what network, what do you mean by networking? Okay, by networking, as I showed you in the first diagram, is we take their narratives and look at the linkages they make amongst the various key scientific terms. Mm -hmm. Students have higher network scores, have higher number of multiple linkages in their thing, causal. Thinking. Like the first the network I showed you, they can say, oh, well, plants are very important because they take up CO2. And, uh, they're, but their roots put out C, produce CO2, and that will uh, give food for the microbes, and they produce more CO2, and the plants have to take up all that kind of thinking that's multi causal and multi relational. I'm glad you asked. It's that kind of thinking. Other that's students. That's oh. like concept mapping. Well, yeah, concept mapping is a complementary idea. The trouble, I'm going to get into this so much detail. The trouble with concept mapping is it's these diagrams of students, and we've worked with some of those diagrams. Uh, students make, but you have to teach them this rather rigid way of doing it. We look at their natural discourse and infer from the evidence what they're doing in terms of the relationships. I think that's more natural uh, and, in fact, for the students, a, a more creative one. Yes, you have a question? Uh, I was at the grocery store, it was last year, and I was going to buy some frozen tilapia mm -hmm. from Food Run, and uh, I read the ingredients they had carbon uh, monoxide in there. Why did they put that in there? Carbon monoxide? Uh, yeah. well, I don't, I no, don't carbon know. dioxide. Well, thank you. Well, well I mean, they fast freeze the fish of the frozen? Yeah. Oh, they fast freeze it with CO2 gas. You know, by liquid CO2, they fast freeze it. That makes it very well preserved. But CO2 in that form is innocuous. It probably puts out CO2 all the time, so you don't need to worry about I that. Would, I didn't buy it, and I'll never buy it as long as it has that. But is it okay to eat something? Yeah, because like I say, it's, yeah, because your body produces CO2 all the time, and so the mountain there's gonna be real, real, very little after that. They flash freeze it, I think. Yeah. Somebody, yes. somebody told me to preserve the flavor. Does that preserve? Yeah, the because very flash freezing it produces the flavor. But don't worry about that part. That's much trivial compared to how much you're putting out the atmosphere. But it's a good point that you make. Right. They use it in many ways, right? Yes. Have you done any research with network um, mapping and elementary school children? Yeah. Uh, it's been done, not us, but other people have replicated our work. Uh, fifth graders, for example, learning about the phases of the moon and how planets move and so forth, also exhibit the same phenomenon that if they have a better capacity to network that information, how the sun's gravity influences the movement of uh, uh, the planets and the moon and the earth and all that. They, of course, do better in understanding and explaining the seasons or working in the laboratory work. I'm glad you asked. We've actually replicated this from fifth grade up through teacher education students. <laughs> and the same thing holds. Uh, do you think you could go lower than fifth grade? No, the problem is that it is based on oral and verbal information. And then the information they're able to share in their own natural way, which you want them to do, is too limited to really study it. Now, there may be other ways of getting at it that we haven't been inventive enough to do with the younger children, or other people with the younger children, but it's potentially possible if they point at something or can't
Uh, one there, and then I'm glad you're asking questions. Are there any small trees in the garden? Uh, well, to do it on a scale that would make a big difference uh, uh, by conservation and planning would be a huge uh, a project. And uh, the Arctic isn't that unfrozen yet that we can ensure that things we plant would survive. What's happening is the little shrubby willows and so forth that naturally grow there are moving their territory further and further by natural warmth. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about, like, say, hundreds of thousands of square miles. So trying to plant those would be a real challenge without a true knowledge of whether they're going to survive relative to the natural process of things coming in. So, yeah, well, these are things which we may be forced to do eventually. But the problem, the other problem, folks, is because the soil is undoing so much, the natural trees are topping falling over because they didn't have deep roots because of the permafrost. They were stable enough, but as it gets so soft and fluffy, well, they're falling over. So there's another problem. But, uh, yes? Well, I, I, I was curious about uh, why uh, it's considered so important the network ability. In the sense, so one could think that uh, it captures some other cognitive ability of the children or the person. And the same cognitive ability is the one that makes them successful in uh, uh, building up. Well, I'm going to show you some evidence. Uh, no, I was curious. No, I'm going to show you some evidence. Yeah. On. Yeah, first of all, let me say, unlike uh, some of the folks, I'm sorry if I seem too enthusiastic about our own work, I don't claim networks are the entire explanation for enhancing students' class. And I recognize the creative ways people can utilize information beyond this particular approach. Yeah. But we are examining it as a variable we can get a handle on, so to speak, and looking at it. Uh, but let me show you in a moment, uh, and then we'll talk about it again, because it's a good point. But we've done some neural psychological stuff on the Yes? Uh, you may be going to cover this coming up, but I was curious about the person's network score just relates to their IQ. Is one necessarily okay the other? Yeah. Uh, we don't have really strong evidence on that yet. Now, I'm sure there must be some relationship. And in fact, when I read, walked up to my students, I asked them the question, if in fact we can enhance IQ or what we consider to be intelligence quotients by helping the network. Because I would imagine, since so much of it depends on verbal relations in these IQ tests, if we were to help students, I mean, we do have evidence we can do that. And that's one of the papers they mentioned in the paper on the brain. But we can. In, and students' networking capacity, and they do then learn better. I imagine that their IQ scores will go up so they have so much of it is verbal. But trying to partial out what intelligence is, you know, is a very naughty problem, and uh, one has to be careful not to confuse the measures with the underlying reality, I'd say that. And so, yeah, I'm sure there's an interaction effect with those two, but we haven't really partialed that out. Now, I'll show you again some evidence that relates to that. Yeah. You know, but, uh, one way, I feel encouraged in this way, that in the youth program that I'm involved in, we give kids uh, sort of an hour or two hours of STEM experience, for example, right? So I think what you're saying to me is that, that there's value there and that there's a potential ability to create a networking base so that when that child goes into the classroom, they can now have more ability to Yeah, well, that's one, I think, affordances of the STEM science, technology, math, uh, engineering, as we call it, because it does require the person to think about relationships in a multi-causal way, and not just some narrow, you know, if you're going to study now what cows are or something, but how organisms and the environment and our man, our human-made world, the modern <laughs> human-made world, interact in engineering. Uh, yeah, those do challenge the students just by the nature of the discipline hopefully to think in these multiple relational ways. So, so any experiences are going to be positive towards that, getting more ability to, to make connections. Well, that's what we, that we hope that yeah, is a kind of fa uh, forward, fast forward me uh, feeding, sorry, mechanism to think. Yeah, that's part of it. OK, good, just stop me. <laughs> So we have this evidence on this part, so we said you can get more knowledge if you have networks, plus other things you may do, uh, that you can think 
effectively about problems and problem solving with networks. And now we want to ask the question, which gives this gentleman's point uh, indirectly. And we've also used some neuropsychological tests to ask the question, uh, to what extent is that networking ability that people can do a function of various portions of the brain we know mediate certain things that they do? And we know, for example, I'll do this very superficially, but hopefully enough to make sense here, that the frontal part of the brain, which has been studied by uh, fMRI and other imaging techniques, uh, is the part of the brain that's most active when we're using executive control, thinking about what we're doing, planning, uh, thinking uh, rationally about issues. Uh, uh, that part of the brain is developed most highly in humans uh, and can be uh, assessed by certain, certain other paper and pencil tests I'll talk about. Uh, then, of course, when we talk about memory, uh, our memories are positive and held, if you will, in the parts of the brain where they originally first sensed. So, for example, touch and uh, internal body perceptions are in this portion of the brain, uh, and uh, all visual initial processing is in this portion of the brain, and that's where your visual memories are. If you have a memory of your mother's face or where you went to school, you actually reactivate the portions of the brain here that initially were activated when you saw it. You now know that from these uh, fMRI imaging kind of processes. And then somatic memory about uh, a language is here in the temporal lobe on either side of the brain, the left one particularly in most people. And it's interesting too, I might point out to you that uh, when, when they're doing surgery, for example, and they have to make a decision in the brain, they want to find out what portion of the brain is less likely to be injured when they have to go in to take, say, an epileptic center out. They probe the brain and find out what with electrodes what people think. Because when you open the skull, it's no longer a sense of the pain in there. Uh, they probe it with electrodes and find out what people hear or think. And they found that language, if you're bilinguistic, is deposited in different portions of the brain. You have, say, English here and perhaps Spanish here. They actually find that the languages are learned and stored in different parts of this lobe. Uh, so I, I'm not particularly bilingual. I know some German, but I had to learn it later. But particularly people who are naturally bilingual in their um, childhood, for example, have these very distinct regions. So I think those of you who are can realize you switch back and forth between the two, but they are in different parts. Yes. Is that why they say that if you're going to learn a language and not have an accent, you have to truly learn it? that you should be before the age of five or six? That's, That's right, because it is because definitely that is. initially okay. uh, instantiated through these definite places in the brain is very much then part of the circuit. Well, fundamentally, that so, what, what, oh, I'm sorry, another question? So where is the networking? Well, that's where our question is. Okay. That, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I didn't pay her for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. no, that's what we want to know. What part of the brain likely is most accountable for that process? So, uh, because uh, networking is probably, we think, theoretically, this capacity to use executive functions, that is to interrelate things and to understand their relationships and the way you can apply them, we would hypothesize that it's the frontal lobe where that's likely to be most directly related, right? So we wanted to test, is, in fact, is the frontal cortex, as opposed to other general knowledge recall portions of the brain, uh, the part that's mediating that. So we tested students for frontal lobe capacity using a standard neuropsychological computer-based test. They look on a screen, and uh, this is the Wisconsin card starting in the past where they see different shapes, they have to infer what the key features are, and it keeps changing, they've got to rethink it. At any rate, that score has been shown to be very closely related to frontal lobe activity and related uh, uh, memory kind of dynamic processes, but not just pure memory. So we wanted to find out then if we took um, uh, the network score that the student had versus their specific fact recall, which would be memory just general facts, how does that relate to uh, frontal lobe test data? Does it predict this more or that or this memory test data, which is uh, 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 a test of how many things you can remember in a string of numbers and letters, basically. So what we're trying to find out is with these sets of tests, what does the frontal lobe test get most? Network score or something else? And sort of gets a little bit of that question, not full. So what we found is 
that, in fact, the frontal lobe resolves of that Wisconsin cord circuit task predict networking sparks significantly, much more significantly uh, than it does any other particular just recall of general knowledge. And a memory test, uh, this general memory test of numbers, letter sequence, doesn't relate to networking sparks. And that does, however, the memory test, general memory test, does relate to a specific recall. So you have this what we call double dissociation evidence that this really predicts networking score, but not the other. And the memory test score predicts maybe specific recall. This is called double dissociation. So we kind of partial out a bit through this simple study whether the front lobe, in fact, is accounting for the networking. And we have fair evidence now that it does, and that it's something different than from your general memory or specific memory kind of uh, recall. So this is the uh, sort of a little bit of the spirit of our uh, neuropsychological uh, test that we've used. It's not invasive. We don't put students in any kind of stance where they can be in trouble. Uh, but this is part of the evidence. So I noticed my freshmen who are ninth graders don't uh, apparently don't have such a great fun of love at that point in the And um, they don't have executive skills. So they don't really understand the cause and effect really well because they make bad decisions sometimes. But, so are you saying if you can get them to network something about their activities that they're doing, that will help them grow that? Okay, let me, uh, let me that's good, the question's got several parts to it. First of all, you're quite accurate. The frontal lobe is the last part of the brain to fully mature in human beings. Right. We call the myelination, that is the white matter that allows it to conduct, the nerves to conduct. It's still developing in adolescence for many people. And the kids who are a little more advanced in their ability to do the executive function just happen to have a front lobe that's developing a little faster. Um, it's interesting, I think, I would not have any evidence to say that by teaching the network, the brain's getting better. But what we can show you is, I think, from our evidence, that they use what they have better. In other words, it's not a matter of, I, I can say that you're uh, uh, epigenetically or uh, indirectly affecting the brain by teaching them the network. And I think it's more likely what we can teach them to do is utilize the capacity that's there more effective. And then as they mature, use it continuously to a better advantage. That's my best guess at this point, because usually those things are genetically determined, but not entirely, because the decade of the brain show most remarkably how plastic our brains are, that you can actually induce changes in the brain by uh, changing the environment people are in. And that's how we now know that, for example, you can uh, have a stroke in one part of the brain, but by engaging in physical and mental uh, um, therapy, get that part of the brain to take over that function that didn't do before. So that is good news in the sense our brains are relatively plastic. Or whether you can really drive the natural genetic development by things like teaching the network, I don't know. It's a good question we want to look into. I guess I'm not sure exactly the methodology. It wouldn't be invasive. <laughs> so this last part then was to try to explain on a uh, neuropsychological basis the assumptions we tested previously about the general cognitive function. And if they can get more knowledge, they can organize it better, they can use it better, and it's probably the frontal lobe that's mediating those advantages that they get through the network. Uh, so, here are the people I need to recognize. If someone's here, I am not recognizing. Please challenge me. I have so many wonderful students and colleagues. Uh, I do want to recognize those who worked with me, uh, particularly these parts, the microbe research. Uh, Linda Amaral Zettler was one of my PhD students. I was on the commission. She's now senior scientist at Woods Hole in the molecular genetics lab. Paul Bennett is currently your director of the water quality for the <laughs> Department of uh, uh, environmental Protection. Mary Gastrick she was an uh, administrator in New Jersey for the um, uh, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection for Quality of the Oceans and uh, Coastal uh, Regions. Howard Spiral is now a professor of paleoecology at uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara. Kazuhiro Sugiyama is at the University of Tokyo as a biologist. Neil Slomberg is the uh, director of polar programs for NSF. Oh, and David is professor of uh, 
paleontology at the uh, University of Southern California. So these are some of the folks who work with me over here for the science education. Paul Bischoff, he is a professor in the uh, University of New York, State University of New York. Incidentally, he was elected at this college as the most outstanding professor a couple of years ago. Judy Contino, Contino, you heard her name this morning. This is you know, one of those papers where we show that if you teach students a network of the kind we do it, they, they do better. Uh, Art Demetrius was an instructor of biology here in New York City for some time. Paul Malongo uh, is a professor at the University of Texas, Houston in science and health studies. And David Randall is at the American Museum of Natural History. Both he and Julie in essential leadership roles there. And Chin Chung Tsai is a distinguished professor in uh, uh, science and uh, technology in uh, Asia. So these are some of my students, and there are many more, but I do want to acknowledge the ones that work most clearly with me. And finally, let's not forget the earth. Uh, <laughs> kind to our earth. It's the only known one we have with life on it. Maybe more, but keep speculating. But this is the only one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, two things. First of all, the Earth initially was entirely free of oxygen and was largely a reducing environment, CO2, methane, and other things. Then when the green algae, the green algae and cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria are a tiny group of green bacteria, they literally produced most of the oxygen in the Earth. They were so many like the white algae, they converted the Earth from CO2-rich place to optimal oxygen balance place by taking up that CO2. Uh, then over many periods of time through the Carboniferous, you have tree ferns and other plants developing, they helped to drop down. Then this volcanism period came about. Uh, and the, the Siberia, the traps as they call it, was the whole portion of the continent turned into a volcano. Huge amounts of CO2 came out that time. And then the earth really began to heat up because of all this CO2 from the volcano. And during that period of time, which geologists refer to to remind us, look, it happened naturally, we're doing the same thing, be careful. Uh, the Earth was very much warm, and all the signatures from the microorganisms show that, and also the uh, other geological indicators that the Earth was warm. And then, of course, that volcanism uh, subsided, and the plants really started taking over more, and they drew it down. It was the plants that drew it down to that balance I showed you. So that's the brief geological history I can give you what has happened. It was the volcano, to the best of our knowledge, that produced a lot of that. Some of the arguments that are being made now are warned against uh, whether or not uh, human beings are causing war. Well, here's the problem, folks. That took thousands of years, the volcanoes, to do it. In since 1850s, we've increased it that I mean, it, the, the curve is so directly related to output from our fossil fuels, folks, you just can't deny it. That part is clear. Now, you can argue, well, other things in the Earth are going to balance it out and so forth. But the people who just will not recognize that our industrial affordances that we have through the remarkable use of fossil fuel. And I'm aware of the economic importance of all that. And I understand the necessity to think about this in that work term and realize that the environment is also our social and our economic and our business environment. We have to think about all these things. But let's face it. We have to, this out in the atmosphere. They're constantly measuring on, um, uh, in Hawaii, on the mountain there in Hawaii, uh, and it's going up and up and up, and the curve is still ascending. So we're doing this. The question is then, how are we going to balance the economic and the social issues with the realities of the consequences? For us, it's not so bad for us, but you now have in the United Nations, people on the Pacific Islands, ready to sue us because they're going to be wiped out in a couple of decades. Their islands are nearly at sea level. And as the CO2 warms the atmosphere, it warms the oceans, they increase in volume, and, uh, and also, they, of course, the thermal heat. Uh, uh, those islands are going to be wiped off the Earth because the ocean's getting so much higher. If they're subsiding slightly, all the worse. So it's the people often in the underdeveloped nations at the coast who are going to get 
Huh? Yeah, that's correct. And in Bangladesh, in the lower lying regions already, they're flooded. To the extent that what happens is that in one account, I'll be right with you in here, uh, the tigers that normally lived in the forest, quite separate from the villages, are now being forced out by what, and they're attacking and killing people. People who suddenly find your neighbor dead, mangled because of the animals are being forced out. Now again, these are isolated but terrible events, and I don't mean to be too negative, because there are probably solutions. First of all, I teach in science, technology, and society, and I tell them I have confidence in human ability to adjust themselves and what we do. I don't think this is going to be calamitous. I think we're going to figure out ways to adjust what we're doing. And I'm going to say that very positively. But we've got to recognize the challenge, you know, and where we're going. And part well, of it is. I think you say there's a tipping point at which there's no hope anymore. Well, yeah, and we don't know what that tipping point is. It's not that there's no hope, but there are ways of ameliorating how much is in the atmosphere. One of the scientists here at Columbia University is trying to figure out a way of relatively inexpensive of trapping it again. You know, various uh, fibers and things they put out in towers and then putting its feet in the earth. Yeah, that's right. The other thing some of our scientists are allowed to do, and again, pumping the carbon dioxide, liquefying it down into rocks, so it's not going to be particularly a problem. And then it solidifies as rock. Well, well that's, that's another way. It's expensive a bit. But there are these things happening, and so we're trying to reduce the risk by putting out less, but also sequestering the CO2. And I think we will eventually do this, uh, but it's going to be a little bit of a risky path, exactly. And she's got, <laughs> there's that other kind of knowledge we all know about. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, more. yeah actually, it's on the same line. I mean, uh, if I want to understand historically, there, would, there have been instances of uh, dropping of temperature in the Middle Age uh, and in the 1600s, I think. The Middle Ice Age, yeah. Yeah. You know what that was due to? Yeah, the, 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 this is the thing. Well, I mean, it's Krakatoa. Yeah. See, what happened is the volcano went off, and it, I'm talking about the CO2, but it puts out all this ash into the atmosphere, and that's what some people are saying. Well, if the volcanoes come active again, the ash reflects the sunlight back. And that's what cooled the Earth, is all this huge sudden volcanic activity. So that CO2 wasn't a critical thing there, it was all the ash. Now, anytime you have a high volcano, you saw the airplanes can't go through and so forth, it resides in aerosols up there in the atmosphere, and it reflects the sunlight back and then it cools the Earth. So the albedo effect of the particulates is about reflected by the atmosphere. It can help cool the Earth, and there are people suggesting you put stuff out <laughs> Yeah, well, that's got its own problems. You don't want to create more problems by trying to ameliorate. But it was that. They, they can explain it. Yeah. So, so, yeah, that's quite well accepted. It's Sorry? Uh, so this is the accepted that's explanation. That's the accepted, well, it's almost pretty certain, you know, because they, they knew when it happened. And, this kind of thing. and, of course, there was a year without summer back there. Uh, yeah. And you had, couldn't grow plants. It was that chilly and snowed even in the summer because of that. But you know that will happen uh, as a feedback on the loop. But that's not as long lasting. The CO2, you see, it probably stays in the atmosphere hundreds of years, even with plants and everything. That's the other problem. That's its equilibrium time that lasts at least hundreds of years in the atmosphere. So getting it out by the natural processes is slow. We can enhance it with these trapping mechanisms that the engineers have talked about. That make up. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yes. What is the difference between climatic change and yearly weather pattern. In another world, why if it is so warm, we get in such a terrible winter weather? Yeah, well, you must realize something about this. As I pointed out, the Arctic was much warmer than Minnesota. The reason is, as you alter the Arctic ice sheets and the general meteorology up there, the uh, cold air comes settling down. Like in, in your house, you know, the floor is colder than the ceiling. It comes settling down. We altered these normal processes in place. So that's why Minnesota and the rest of us have been getting this tremendous bulge of cold Arctic air. They're warmer than Minnesota. It's moving down. So on the average, the planet is not colder. We think it is, because right now in my New York, it's awfully cold in January and February. You know the autumn was the warmest autumn in the decade? We forget that, see, because January and February was so tremendously cold. But it's the cold air is see seeping down unnaturally because of part of this climate change problem. It's a very complex issue. And even scientists have to recognize we don't understand all what's happening. And I'm not expert particularly beyond my 
biology and other aspects of it. But it is very complex, but at the same time, the West was hottest as ever been. Transpire is the drought. And you can look at the degrees of the uh, temperature of the whole planet, and it is increasing year by year, except for this brief plateau at this point. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not reasonable to deny the scientific facts. It is reasonable to discuss how do we deal with it, what are the magnitudes of the problem, Let's not keep denying it and act like it's not there. <laughs> That's not going to help. So those are the only people I am discouraged about, and the ones who are called the deniers, that they will not accept the scientific facts. And uh, so, again, I'm not saying the uh, answer is to give up our advantage as an industrialized society or anybody else, but you try to figure out how we're going to work together, folks, to get this problem solved. We all ought to come together and not deny it while things are definitely happening. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, it seems pretty clear from like cognitive as well as uh, neurological, neuropsychological research that networking is effective towards learning and acquiring new skills. So I was wondering if you have done personally, or you know people who have done uh, behavioral research on the formation of networking and whether they have uh, seen behavioral increases in different uh, psychomotor and kind of manual. Training. Yeah. Whether I mean. Not in a sense more in manual, but uh, more of like a practical behavioral research with children um, in terms of what types of behavior contribute to the formation of networking and well, then how that it has. We haven't looked at the interaction between uh, uh, management in the, in the um, affective domain, like classroom management issues, and what, you know, the students who are more capable of socially intelligent, are they also more networking on social dimensions, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, because I mean, it would be interesting if you could find the behavioral patterns that lead towards that networking, you know, clicks within the brain. Because right, I think okay. that would be more effective into implementing it to kids who have not developed it yet. Yeah, well, well I think you're on another important track. I think we have very good evidence now, neuropsychologically, that our cognitive thinking capacity is built on earlier psychomotor relationships. We learn about balance through before we ever learn words, children show a lot of capacity to understand how things are related. And so I think you're on the right track. We have a look at that. I think that is a very good question. One minute? One minute. Yeah, no, I just wanted um, uh, mindfulness techniques in order to test whether it has a positive impact on the development of their executive mm -hmm. functioning. So that's a really, you know, really, really interesting um, uh, research project that's going on here at Teachers College, and they're just, you know, they've just gotten started. So, you know, it might provide some yeah, clues hopefully. about that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that is a that's a neuro linguistic place in this still mm -hmm. this verbal dimension. I think something else I find interesting. It has to do with these other ways we know of a similar sense and other kinds of psychomotor ways, perhaps behavioral ways that are not just linguistically based. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think that's that is a very interesting. Uh, because one little quick thing too, one other study in psycholinguistics has shown probably that our language did develop from sign language initially. That, for example, the chimpanzees, the great primates, from which branch somewhere back there we came up, use gestures quite a bit more than people realize when they think probably of course the really human uh, civilization is communicated first by sign language and then maybe eventually through oral and verbal ways. So uh, it's all very interesting. I think he's an interesting invention. And your work is very significant. Yeah. <laughs> no, work. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's an important way to go. But it's like, it, it just seems that there's a lot of interconnections and ways to approach it. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, very good. Yes, you know, but first year, then we go there. Um, recording? What is your... Well, can we let this lady now go there? Yeah, what is your opinion about the um, uh, Keystone Pipeline? Uh, I heard that if that is approved, it will be a disaster. Yeah, well, I'm not expert enough to talk about the kind of engineering aspects of what that is. That is, I think the biggest problem is not the pipeline itself. I think the uh, environmental impact studies I've heard Say the pipeline itself will not cause such great problems. It's not going through regions where you're going to upset the ecological balance. The problem is the shale the process of removing it is a very dirty <laughs> process. In other words, you have to 
do a lot of treatment of that to get the stuff out, which itself puts out a lot of polluting uh, materials into the atmosphere. That's what I've heard. And so I don't know the final word on it. I'm not an expert and I can't comment. Uh, but that is the trade-off issue. There it is, and we can get it out more efficiently. And it's not, it's, but it's also going to be a still dirty CO2 outputting uh, fossil fuel. Does that That's sound right. good? Yeah, I'm kind of question. Regarding the Antarctic, the ice, um, the melting, so, so, so. Uh, not as dramatically interesting. There is the Antarctic ice sheet, which they're yeah. studying down there, and it hasn't been so uh, massively affected so far, because they're pointing out. That is the real elephant in the room you talk about. Because it's so huge, that ice shelf extends out over the ocean there, very long. If it were to collapse up, that would put a huge amount of extra water. Because it's not floating ice, that's land type ice. Ice that's floating in the water already has isostatic volume, saying it would make a difference. This is kind of surface ice. That goes into the ocean, that will raise it more. So they're very worried about that ice shelf. <coughs> I don't have all the data, but I understand it's, even this year it was a little colder down there than normally. Uh, so we get these you know, ups and downs and the whole thing, even though it's top temperature, there are places down. Uh, but that is a big issue. Yeah, another comment. Oh, yeah, over here. I guess. Hi. I have a question on your data analysis. Um, you talked about the Antarctic Ice Sheet. Um, is that something that's going to be uh, oh, well, first of all, the Wisconsin Carn SART is a computer based method. That's there. The networking is the way we normally do it by coding for the number of connections that they have. The, the, the quantitative uh, recall was done by coding how many statements in the recall and strictly quantitative type the higher order kind of uh, questions. And then the number. Uh, letter sequence test is another neuropsychological uh, test with its own way of coding and uh, analyzing it. It tells you just how much wrong you have, basically. It's a standard test. It's a standard test. standard, yeah. The test is standard, pretty much. Thanks, that's a good question. Could you uh, talk a little more about the difference between concepts and the knowledge networking, and particularly a little more about how one constructs a concept network. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, it's it's more methodological okay. than conceptually substantive. Uh, concept map is a varied types, but it's where students take some seminal ideas, you might say uh, labels, we could call them, like photosynthesis, uh, plants, and microorganisms, and so forth. And then they write, they put those down on, in, as uh, nodes, we call it, and then they write a link. Uh, plant is photosynthetic, and photosynthetic, so forth. Yeah, I know about concept mapping. The problem I'm having is the difference between that and knowledge networking. Okay, knowledge network, as I say, we don't make the kids construct such a, a diagram. We take their narrative, either the, we listen to interview, are they right, and we look for literally the semantic, propositional, they call it, connections they make, and naturally make. And, and the thing I'll do is show you the counterpoint, which is not in the outbring. It's just a list of, some students think just in an ordinal list of ideas. There's no in evidence at all of propositional thinking that relate to things. Uh, a plant is green. Uh, the soil is uh, where life is. You know, that kind of a thing. And they never go back and say, well, a plant is green. It's part of the life that's rooted in the soil. Something like that. That's what we mean by network. The ability to do multiple relational thinking other than just a list of facts. And that's the thing that's a low score, being just a list of kind of facts, I think, versus this ability to multiple relate things and come back to them recursively. We find out the students who can recursively come back to an idea and interlink it, we call the distance linkage, is much more sophisticated than just simply short term. Answer. But do you have a rubric that helps to inform you how you assess what the student writes or says? Uh, yeah, we do have a way of doing that. That's okay. correct. Yeah, and this is the final question the other teacher tells me. Yes. <laughs> one more. Is there anyone? One more? Yeah, exhausted you. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much.